Today we continue our series in the Beatitudes, and we'll be reading from Matthew 5, verse 7. If you'll stand. Blessed are the merciful, they will be shown mercy. The King James says, blessed are the merciful, they will obtain mercy. Other translations, blessed are the merciful, they will receive mercy. So for us today, blessed are the merciful, they will obtain, receive, or be shown mercy. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. Mercy is one of those words, um, I'm not sure it would make the top ten of words Christians use. We're not always exactly sure what it means, but in the soup of the Christian faith, it's right in there. It's one of the main ingredients, um, love, grace, mercy, forgiveness. It's all right in there. They're all kind of tied up together. They all kind of spread from one to the next, and I want you to know today that these things, this soup, is the core of the Christian faith. If we take that away, and in our lives we're not experiencing or practicing love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, then the Christian faith that we are executing is not what God sent Jesus to earth to teach. The Christian faith does not exist without grace, love, mercy and forgiveness uh, someone said justice is getting what you deserve mercy is getting uh, uh, what is not getting what you deserve grace is getting better than what we deserve um, a couple of months ago pastor Sean was preaching and one of the Sunday school classes said hey we've collected some questions come talk to us and one of the questions was uh, how many angels fit on the head of a pin no uh, one of the questions was, what's the difference between grace and mercy? And so I went to my theological books because I wanted to appear that I was, you know, prepared. And uh, the answer I brought to the class that day uh, from the great theologians is that grace is this giant, overreaching, amazing, overarching, sweeping uh, principle that just flows through everything. It can be talked about in, in so many different ways. It's just happening all over the place and, and it's unquantifiable. Mercy tends to normally boil down to a person, an act, a moment in time. So there's a lot of different ways to talk about grace and we bring it into our faith in lots of different ways. But when we start talking about mercy, it sort of gets personal. It's about me and Walt, or me and Deborah, or me and Doc. It's about me and somebody, and it's about, it's, it, it begins to start asking us the question of how we are relating to one another and treating one, one another. Uh, mercy is like a stay of execution. Uh, something should have been coming my way. There was something that looked like it was coming my way, uh, but I received something else instead. Uh, Paul makes this uh, pretty clear, takes this uh, point on it in Ephesians chapter 2, where he writes, As for you, uh, you, you and me, not just you as the Ephesians, but you and me, us. Uh, as for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We, you, me, us, we uh, were dead in our transgressions and sins, and we were deserving of wrath. But, but, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in, in transgressions, it's by grace you have been saved. So you see, we deserved one thing, but we got another. And if you're here today and, and you are feeling pretty good about your life, you may not, you'll have to think harder about this, but if you walked in the door today and, and your heart is broken because of something that you've done and you feel particularly like 
horrible, horrible sinner, and we all have days like that, I want to tell you this is good news. This comes washing into our heart and mind, and we say, oh my gosh, even though I'm there, even though I did that, even though this is going on in my life, God is rich in mercy, and he forgives me, and he sets aside those things. This is why the gospel is good news. It frees us to live. It takes what might have otherwise happened to us and gives us instead the amazing love of God. It's all the more amazing um, because Jesus came into a world that was all about justice. The great virtue of the Greco-Roman world was justice, black and white, right and wrong, good and bad. Here's how it is. Uh, it, was, it was all about justice and everyone getting, getting their, their dues. And Jesus brings this message of a God who says, not what you deserve, but love and mercy. And not just for you, but for your entire family and for your entire church. And, and worse yet, to the Greco-Roman mind, it's for the entire society. God's kingdom comes in proclaiming that love and mercy is for everyone. And it was a completely new invitation to a completely new way of living. We struggle with this. It's not easy for us. It doesn't come naturally to us. Lyle Lovett had a little country song some years back that talked about uh, forgiving someone and the chorus said God does but I don't God will but I won't and that's the difference between God and me we we hear I mean what I'm going to read to you is is the most rudimentary beginning pieces of Jesus teaching and and as pure and good and wonderful as it is it still so totally challenges us because it doesn't come naturally to us from Luke 6. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father in heaven is merciful. And so we're invited to live in a different kind of world. Instead of thinking, I bought the pizza, so now it's your turn. Instead of thinking, you dented my car, so you better fix it. We are invited to live in a world where we are giving grace, where we are giving mercy, where we don't let stuff or hurt come between us. What humans naturally do is to allow all that stuff to come between us. And Jesus is saying, not anymore, because God's grace is so amazing. His mercy is so great towards us. We can receive it, and we can pass it on as well. This is not uh, a random sidebar sermon like something your pastor might come up with some other day. This concept flows through all of Scripture. It is replete from the beginning to the end. And so we could spend all morning reading passages that, 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 that talk about this principle. Uh, let's look at another familiar one. Uh, Pastor Gina led us in the Lord's Prayer. We find this in Matthew 6. Jesus is saying, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm doing okay so far. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts or trespasses as we also have forgiven our debtors or trespassers. Oops. Anybody else? Does that kind of get you? You kind of go, uh, uh. Does this actually mean that I'm in trouble with God if I don't forgive you? Well, let's 
continue with the prayer. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus adds some commentary. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And I'm just going to say this. If I take that on face value, I'm going to live in a cycle of not being able to figure it out because I know I'm not perfect. And if I can't get it right, then if I take it that way, if I get stuck on the negative side of this, it's going to self-perpetually in my brain make me feel like it ain't going to work between me and God. But if, on the other hand, I start to think about what I hope to receive from God, if I start thinking about what I hope God gives to me, oh, I'm telling you, I understand this. I got an entire year of my life that I want him to say, I don't recall. I got things that I did when I was young, I didn't notice. Numerous things I could point out to you that I want to hear the words, Son, your sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb. And if I understand what I want God to give to me, then this invitation is that I do the same for you. That's what God wants. The very same deliverance that we get from our Father, He wants us to give to one another. And as long as we can do that, I don't have to worry about the negative implication of that statement. There is a clear expectation that is central to Christianity that we will release others. And you know, if you have something against someone, who needs to be forgiven more? Who needs the transaction to happen more, you or them. When we think about forgiveness, we always think about them. Well, you did me so wrong, you know, it's all about somehow you've hurt me. And we forget that the longer we carry these burdens and these resentments, they keep us from the kind of relationship with God that he wants us to have. As long as we're holding on to a resentment against someone else, as long as we receive to grant them mercy, we ourselves are carrying great burdens. If you want to be free to wake in the morning and say, thank you, God, for the gift of this day. Thank you for the joy of living. Thank you for all that there is. Then we've got to release those people who have hurt us. It is an expectation of the Christian faith. It is a core part of the soup. William Barclay says that we learn to understand what mercy is when we get inside the skin of the other person. To think and measure them not simply by what I think of you, but to try to get into your world, to try to into your brain, to try to consider your past, your hurts, what I know about you. And the idea is that once we begin to see others as God sees them, then our treatment of them will totally change. We have an illustration of this. Kid, every time I'm pulling out, he's right there. Man, and someone needs to talk to his parents <laughs> if they're ever at home. What is up with the traffic today? It's and always, every day, this intersection's always crowded. I hate pulling out of here. We need some of these dumb roads. Oh, there's. <sighs> okay, so I'm not even here. Right. Great lady. The princess of parking. Sure. 
take this spot. Way to be considerate. Oh, are you kidding me? Unbelievable. Oh. Thank you, man. Oh, it's about time. Let's see, what do I want? Uh, yeah, could I add a cookie to that order? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, uh, no problem, only guy in the world. I'm sure you need your cookie. The world, your oyster, and he's serving your cookie. Thanks, Thank sir. you so much. Uh -huh. What can I get for you? Uh, yeah, I'll have a tall decaf macchiato. Yeah, sure, no problem. Three three eighty-five. And uh, it might take a few minutes here. We've got quite a line, obviously, and thanks for your patience. Great. Yeah, <laughs> great. Great for me. Waiting again. Unbelievable. What? What? What am I supposed to do? How can I how can I do anything about that? Can I even help with that? Oh your copy, sir. Oh. I can't I can't take this anymore. I gotta get out of here. Hey, watch it. Hey, buddy, come here. Mercy is personal. It invites me to think about what's really going on with you to get past the place where my brain is only thinking about me. It invites us to look at the people that hurt us and understand that they are broken too. It invites us to look at others as God looks at them. When we get inside another person's skin, we are doing what Jesus did because he came to this earth in the form of a human, so that he could understand how you hurt. And out there, they're waiting for folks like you to be merciful. People at work, people in the neighborhood. It's easy for Christians to be judgmental. But there's no beatitude that says, blessed are those who judge. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Jesus did not come to the world to condemn the world. That through him the world might be saved. He didn't come here to condemn. But we can't. We can't. 
To be merciful means to set aside every thought that closes the heart of God off to the people around us. It's to stop setting aside others and see them as God sees them. In 1 Corinthians 13, which we should all have on our refrigerator, if I speak with tongues of men and angels, if I give my body to be burned, if I do all of these things but have not love, it doesn't matter. If God's love is not replete through your life all over everything that you do, then all those religious things are just a bunch of religious junk. And I will tell you, the part of that chapter that sticks out to me over and over again is love keeps no record of wrongs. And the heart of God invites us, begs us to deliver his grace to others just as freely as we ourselves have received it. And that's why we like coming to this place because there's nothing out there that teaches us this. Out there, we're taught about revenge. We're taught about what's mine. But in the Christian church, we are taught about God's amazing grace. And our children have the chance to hear about it and learn it and take it in. So we keep coming so we can be filled. And I hear Jesus thinking about the joy and freedom of living a life where there are no resentments, of living a life that is just a conduit for God's love. And he says, blessed are the merciful because they got a dose of mercy coming their way. You know, one of the amazing things about it is uh, it's never too late. Mercy means it's never too late. It's never too late to start over. It's never too late to forgive someone. It's never too late to work through something. I know people that have gone to the cemetery to get on the other side of a broken relationship with a parent promise of who God is just tells us it is never too late. His mercy means there's always a chance for reconciliation. There's always a chance for hope. There's always a chance for love to rule. There's always a chance for your life to be about what God wants it to be. Blessed are those who give mercy because they will receive, obtain, be filled with mercy. Let's pray. Father, such simple things. Let us be your hands and feet, your voice, your hope to the hungry, to the worried, to the nervous, to those that we didn't have time for, to those that we weren't thinking about, let us see them as you see them, and as we deliver your grace and mercy, may we be filled. In Jesus' name, amen.